The Adornment of the Spiritual Marriage Part 6 Chapter 54 Of a Loving Strife Between the Spirit of God and Our Spirit In this storm of love two spirits strive together, the Holy Spirit of God and our own spirit. God, through the Holy Ghost, inclines himself towards us, and thereby we are touched in love. And our spirit, by God's working and by the power of love, presses and inclines itself into God, and thereby God is touched. From these two contacts there arise the strife of love, at the very deeps of this meeting. And in that most inward and ardent encounter, each spirit is deeply wounded by love. These two spirits, that is, our own spirit and the spirit of God, sparkle and shine one into the other, and each shows to the other its face. This makes each of the spirits yearn for the other in love. Each demands of the other all that it is, and each offers to the other all that it is, and invites it to all that it is. This makes the lovers melt into each other. God's touch and His gifts, our loving craving and our giving back, these fulfill love. This flux and reflux causes the fountain of love to brim over, and thus the touch of God and our loving craving becomes one simple love. Here man is possessed by love, so that he must forget himself and God, and knows and can do nothing but love. Thereby the spirit is burned up in the fire of love, and enters so deeply into the touch of God, that it is overcome in all its cravings, and turned to naught in all its works, and empties itself. Above all surrender becoming very love. And it possesses, above all virtues, the inmost part of its created being, where every creaturely work begins and ends. Such is love in itself, foundation and origin of all virtues. Chapter 55 Of the Fruitful Works of the Spirit, the which are eternal. Now our spirit and this love are living and fruitful in virtues, and for this reason the powers can no longer remain idle in the unity of the Spirit. For the incomprehensible brightness of God and His boundless love brood above the Spirit and touch the loving power, and the Spirit goes forth once more into its works, but with a more sublime and inward striving than ever before. And the more noble and inward it is, the more quickly it is spent and brought to naught in love, and goes forth once more into fresh works. And this is heavenly love. For ever does the craving spirit yearn to eat and to swallow God. But itself is swallowed up in the touch of God, and fails in all its works. For the highest powers are made one in the unity of the Spirit. Here are grace and love in their essence above all works. For here is the source of charity and every virtue. Here there is an eternal outflow into charity and the virtues, and an eternal return with inward hunger for the taste of God and an eternal dwelling within pure love. And all this is in a creaturely way, and below God, 
it is the most inward exercise which one can perform in the created light, in heaven and on earth, and above it there is nothing but the God-seeing life in the divine light and in the God-like way. In this exercise one cannot go astray, nor can one be deceived, and it begins in grace and shall last for ever in glory. Chapter 56 Showing the way in which we shall meet God in a ghostly manner, both within and without means. Now I have shown you how the free and uplifted man becomes, through the grace of God, seeing in his inward practices. And we see that this is the first point which Christ demands and desires of us, where he says, Behold, as to the second and third points, wherein he says, The bridegroom cometh, and go ye out. I have shown you the three ways of the inward coming of Christ, and further that the first is coming has, first, has four degrees, and how we are to go out with practice answering to each other, way in which God inwardly enkindles, teaches, and moves us. Now we must consider the fourth point, which is the last. This is the meeting with Christ our Bridegroom. For all our inward and ghostly vision, in grace or in glory, and all our going out in the virtues, in whatsoever practices this be done, it is all for the sake of a meeting and a union with Christ our Bridegroom. For he is our eternal rest, and the end and wage of all our labor. You know that every meeting is a coming together of two persons, who come from different places, which are separated from, and opposite to, each other. Now Christ comes from above as a Lord and generous giver, who can do all things, and we come from below as the poor servants, who can do nothing of ourselves, but have need of everything. The coming of Christ to us is from within outwards, and we go towards him from without inwards, and this is why a ghostly meeting must here take place. And this coming and this meeting of ourselves in Christ takes place in two ways, to wit, with means and without means. Chapter 57 Of the essential meeting with God without means in the nakedness of our nature. Now understand and mark this well. The unity of our spirit has two conditions. It is essential, and it is active. You must know that the Spirit, according to its essence, receives the coming of Christ in the nakedness of its nature, without means and without interruption. For the being and the life which we are in God, in our eternal image, in which we have within ourselves, according to our essence, this is without means and indivisible, and this is why the Spirit, in its inmost and highest part, that is, in its naked nature, receives without interruption the impress of its eternal archetype, and the divine brightness, and is an eternal dwelling place of God, in which God dwells as an eternal presence, and which he visits perpetually, with the new comings and with new instreamings of the ever-renewed brightness of his eternal birth. For where he comes, there he is, and where he is, there he comes. And where he has never been, there too he shall never come. For neither chance nor change are in him, and everything in which he is, is in him. For he never goes out of himself. And this is why the Spirit in its essence 
possesses God in the nakedness of its nature, as God does the spirit. For it lives in God, and God in it. And it is able, in its highest part, to receive, without intermediary, the brightness of God, and all that God can fulfill. And by means of the brightness of its eternal archetype, which shines in its essentially and personally, the spirit plunges itself and loses itself, as regards the highest part of its life, in the divine being, and there abidingly possesses its eternal blessedness, and it flows forth again, through the eternal birth of the sun, together with all the other creatures, and is set in its created being by the free will of the Holy Trinity. And here it is like unto the image of the Most High Trinity and Unity, in which it has been made. And in its created being, it incessantly receives the impress of its eternal archetype, like a flawless mirror in which the image remains steadfast, and in which the reflection is renewed without interruption by its ever new reception in the new light. This essential union of our spirit with God does not exist in itself, but it dwells in God, and it flows forth from God, and it depends upon God, and it returns to God as to its eternal origin. And in this wise it has never been, nor ever shall be, separated from God. For this union is within us by our naked nature, and were this nature to be separated from God, it would fall into pure nothingness. And this union is above time and space, and is always and incessantly active according to the way of God. But our nature, forasmuch as it is indeed like unto God, but in itself is a creature, receives the impress of its eternal image passively. This is that nobleness which we possess by nature in the essential unity of our spirit, where it is united with, whole, with God according to our nature. This neither makes us holy nor blessed, for all men, whether good or evil, possess it within themselves, but it is certainly the first cause of all holiness and all blessedness. This is the meeting and the union between God and our spirit in the nakedness of our nature. Chapter 58 Showing how one is like unto God through grace, and unlike God through mortal sin. Now consider this thought earnestly. For if you understand well that which I will now tell you, and that which I have told you, you will have understood all the divine truth which any creature can teach you, and far more besides. Otherwise, does our spirit keep itself in that same unity when it is conceived as acting or working? For then it exists in itself as in its created and personal being. This is the source of the higher powers. And here there, there are beginning and the end of all the creaturely works which are worked in a creaturely way, both in nature and above nature. And here the unity does not work for as much as it is unity, but all the powers of the soul, in what way soever they work, derive their strength and their power from their proper source, that is, from the unity of the spirit, where it dwells in its personal being. In this unity the spirit must always either be like unto God through grace and virtue, or unlike unto God through mortal sin. For that man has been made after the likeness of God means that he has been created in the grace of God, the which grace is a God-formed light which shines through us and makes us like to God. And without this light, 
which makes us godlike, we cannot be united with God supernaturally, even though we cannot lose the image of God nor our natural unity with Him. If we lose the likeness, that is, the grace of God, we are damned. And therefore, whenever God finds within us some capacity for the reception of His grace, it is His pleasure and His free goodness to make us, through His gifts, full of life and like unto Him. This always happens whenever we turn to Him with our whole will, for at that very moment Christ comes to us and in us, both with means and without means, that is, with the virtues and above the virtues, and He impresses His image and His likeness in us, namely Himself and His gifts, and He redeems us from sin, and makes us free and like unto Himself. And in that same working, through which God redeems us from sins and makes us free and like unto Him through charity, the Spirit immerses itself in fruit of love. And here there take place a meeting and a union, which are without means and above nature, and wherein our highest blessedness consists. Although all that he gives us from love and free goodness is natural to God, for us, according to our condition, it is accidental and supernatural. For, before, we were strangers and, un and unlike unto God, and afterwards becoming like him, we have received union with God. Chapter 59 Showing how one possesses God in union and rest, above all likeness through grace. This meeting and this union, which the loving spirit achieves in God and possesses without means, must take place in the essential intuition, deeply hidden from our understanding, unless it be an effective understanding to the way of simplicity. In the fruition of this unity we shall rest evermore, above ourselves and above all things. From this unity all gifts, both natural and supernatural, flow forth. And yet the loving spirit rests in this unity above all gifts. And here there is nothing but God, and the spirit united with God without means. In this unity we are taken possession of by the Holy Ghost, and we take possession of the Holy Ghost, and the Father and the Son and the whole divine nature, for God cannot be divided. And the fruitive tendency of the Spirit, which seeks rest in God above all likeness, receives and possesses in a supernatural way, in its essential being, that all that the Spirit ever received in a natural way. All good men experience this, but how it is, this remains from them all their life long, if they do not become inward and empty of all creatures. In that very moment in which man turns away from sin, he is received by God in the essential unity of his own being, at the summit of his spirit, that he may rest in God now and evermore. And he also receives grace and likeness unto God in the proper source of his powers, that he may evermore grow and increase in new virtues. And as long as this likeness endures in charity and in virtues, so long also endures the union in rest and this cannot be lost save only by mortal sin. Chapter 60 Showing how we have need of the grace of God, which makes us like unto God and leads us to God without means. Now all holiness and all blessedness lie in this, 
that the spirit is led upwards through likeness and by means of grace or glory to rest in the essential unity for the grace of God is the way by which we must always go if we would enter into that naked essence in which God gives himself with all his riches without means and this is why the sinners and the damned spirits dwell in darkness for they lack the grace of God which should enlighten them and lead them and show them the way to the fruit of unity yet the essential being of the spirit is so noble that even the damned cannot will their own annihilation but sin builds up a barrier and gives rise to such darkness and such unlikeness between the powers and the essence in which God lives that the spirit cannot be possessed with its proper essence which would be its own and eternal rest did sin not impede it for whosoever lives without sin he lives in likeness unto God and in grace and God is his own and so we have need of grace which casts out sins and prepares the way and makes our whole life fruitful and this is why Christ always comes into us through means that is through grace and multifarious gifts and we too go out towards him through means that is through virtues and diverse practices and the more inward gifts he gives and the more deeply he stirs us the more inward and delightful are the workings of our spirit as you have already heard in all the ways in which have been shown forth before and here there is a perpetual renewal for God ever gives new gifts and our spirit ever turns inward in such wise as it is invited and as is bestowed on it by God and in that meeting it always receives a higher renewal and thus one grows continually into a higher life and this act of meeting is altogether through means for the gifts of God and our virtues and the activity of our spirits are the means and these means are necessary for all men and all spirits for without the mediation of God's grace and a loving turning to him in freedom no creature shall ever be saved chapter 61 of how God and our spirit visit each other in the unity and in the likeness now God sees the dwelling and the resting place which he has made within us and through us namely the unity and the likeness and he wills to visit this unity without interruption in a new coming of his most high birth and with a rich pouring forth of his fathomless love for he wills to dwell in bliss within the loving spirit and he wills to visit the likeness of our spirit with rich gifts so that we become more like unto him and more enlightened in the virtues now it is Christ's will that we should dwell and abide within the essential unity of our spirit rich with him above all creaturely works and above all virtues and that we should dwell actively in that same unity rich and fulfilled with virtues and heavenly gifts and he wills that we shall visit that unity and that likeness without interruption by means of every work which we do for in every new now God is born in us and from this most high birth the Holy Ghost flows forth with all his gifts therefore we should go out to meet the gifts of God through the likeness and the most high birth through the unity
Chapter 62 Showing How We Should Go Out to Meet God in All Our Works Now mark how, in each of our works, we shall go out to meet God, and shall increase our likeness unto Him, and shall more nobly possess the fruit of unity. By good work, how small soever it may be, which is directed to God with love and with an upright and single intention, we earn a greater likeness and eternal life in God. A single intention draws together the scattered powers into the unity of the Spirit and joins the Spirit to God. A single intention is end and beginning and adornment of all virtues. A single intention offers to God praise and honor in all virtues, and it pierces and passes through itself, and all the heavens and all things, and finds God within the simple ground of its own being. That intention is single, which aims only at God, and in all things only at their connection with God. The single intention casts out hypocrisy and duplicity, and a man must possess it and practice it in all his works above all other things. For it is this which keeps man in the presence of God, clear in understanding, diligent in virtue, and free from outward fear, both now and in the day of doom. Singleness of intention is the single eye of which Christ speaks, giving light to the whole body, that is, to the man's works in his whole life, and cleansing it of sin. Singleness of intention is the inward, enlightened, and loving tendency of the spirit, and it is the foundation of all ghostliness. It includes in itself faith, hope, and charity, for it trusts in God and is faithful to Him. It casts nature underfoot. It establishes peace. It drives out ghostly discontent and preserves fullness of life in all the virtues. And it gives peace and hope and boldness towards God, both now and in the day of doom. Thus we shall dwell in the unity of the Spirit, in grace and in likeness, and shall always go out to meet God by means of the virtues, and offer up to Him, uh, with simple intention, our whole life and our works. And thus every work, and ever more and more, we shall increase our likeness. And thus we rise up out of the ground of our single intention, and pass through ourselves and go out to meet God without means, and rest in Him in the abyss of simplicity. There we possess that heritage which has been prepared for us for all eternity. All ghostly life and all works of virtue consists in the divine likeness and in singleness of intention, and all their supreme rest consists in simplicity above all likeness. Nevertheless, one spirit surpasses another in virtue and in likeness, and each possess its own proper being in itself, according to the degree of its nobleness. And God suffices each one in particular, and each one, according to the measure of his love, seeks God in the ground of his spirit, both here and in eternity. Chapter 63 Of the Ordering of All the Virtues Through the Seven Gifts of the Holy Spirit Now consider the order and the degrees of all the virtues and of all holiness, with which we should go out to meet God through resemblance, so that we may rest with him in the unity. The Gift of Fear When a man lives in the fear of God, in the moral virtues and in outward works, 
and when he is obedient and submissive to Holy Church, and to the divine commandments, and when he is ready and willing in simplicity of intention to do all good things, then he is like unto God, through faithfulness, and through the gathering of his will into the will of God, both in doing and in leaving undone. And he rests in God, above likeness. For through faithfulness and singleness of intention, he fulfills the will of God, more or less according to the measure of his likeness. And through love, he rests in his beloved above likeness. THE GIFT OF PIETY And if he exerts himself well in that which he has received from God, then God bestows upon him the spirit of piety and mercy. Thus he becomes gentle of heart, meek, and merciful. And thereby he becomes more full of life and more like to God, and feels himself to be resting more in God, and to be broader and deeper in virtue than before. And he savors this likeness and this rest so much the better, the more his resemblance is increased. THE GIFT OF KNOWLEDGE And if he here exerts himself well, with great zeal, and with a single intention, and fights all that which is opposed to the virtue, this man receives the third gift which is knowledge and discretion. Thus he becomes reasonable and discerning, and knows what to do and what to leave undone, and where he must give and where he must take away. And through simplicity of intention and godly love, this man rests in God above himself in the unity, and he possesses himself in likeness, and he possesses all the works with greater delight, because he is obedient and submissive to the Father, and has reason and discernment through the Son, and is gentle and merciful through the Holy Ghost, and thus he bears a resemblance unto the Holy Trinity, and he rests in God, though through his love and the simplicity of his intention. And herein the whole of the active life consists. Thus a man should exert himself with great zeal, and should follow his single intention with reason and discernment. And he must beware of all that is opposed to the virtues, and must ever bow himself down in humility at the feet of Christ. And in this way he will grow ever more and more in virtue and in resemblance, and if he keeps himself thus, he cannot err. Yet according to this way, he still remains in the act of life. For if a man practices and clings to the activities of the heart and the diversity of works, more than to the ground and reason of all works, and if he busies himself more with the practice of the sacraments, with their forms and outward symbols, than with the ground and the truth which are signified thereby, so he shall ever remain an outward man. But he shall be saved by his good works in the simplicity of attention. THE GIFT OF STRENGTH and, therefore, if a man wishes to come nearer to God, and to exalt his practice and his life, he must proceed from the works to their reason, and from the forms to the truth, and thereby he shall become master of his works, and shall know truth, and shall come into the inward life. And God gives him the fourth gift, which is the spirit of strength. And thus he shall be able to overcome joy and grief, profit and loss, hope and care in earthly things, together with all kinds of hindrances and all multiplicity. And thus he becomes free and detached from all creatures. 
When a man has become free from all creaturely images, he is master of himself, and easily and without labor becomes inward and recollected, and turns freely and without hindrance to God, with fervent devotion, with lofty desire, with thanksgiving and praise, and with a single intention. Thus he enters into fruition of all his deeds and his whole life, inward and outward. For he stands before the throne of the Holy Trinity, and often receives inward consolation and sweetness from God. For he who serves at such a table with thanksgiving and praise, and with inward reverence, often drinks of the wine, and often eats of that which is left, and of the crumbs which fall from the Lord's table. And he continually possesses inward peace, through the singleness of his intention. And if he will abide steadfastly before God in thanksgiving and praise, and with uplifted purpose, the spirit of strength is doubled within him, for then he no longer loses himself in bodily desires, in longings after consolation or sweetness, nor in any other gift but God, nor in rest and peace of the heart. But he will forgo all gifts and every consolation, if so be that he may find him whom he loves. In this way he is strong, who abandons and overcomes the unrest of his heart and earthly things. And doubly strong is he who also forgoes and overpasses every consolation and heavenly gift. Thus a man transcends all creatures, and possesses himself powerful and free, through the gift of spiritual strength. THE GIFT OF COUNSEL When, therefore, no creature can either overcome or impede a man from persisting in his single and upward striving intention, and when through this strength he is steadfast in praising God, seeking and meaning God above all his gifts, then God bestows upon him the fifth gift, which is the gift of counsel. In this gift the Father draws the man inwardly, and calls him to his right hand, with the chosen in his unity. And the Son says, in ghostly wise within him, Follow me to my Father, one thing is needful, and the Holy Ghost makes the heart expand and flame up in fiery love, and thence comes the life of loving tumult and inward restlessness. For, in him who listens to this counsel, there arises a storm of love, and nothing can satisfy him save God alone. And therefore he abandons himself in all things, that he may find him in whom he lives and in whom all things are one. Here the man should have God in mind in a simple way, and should master himself by means of the reason, and should renounce all self-will, and should await in freedom the unity which he desires until the day when it is God's pleasure to give it. Thus the spirit of counsel works in him in two ways. For that man is great, and follows the precept and counsel of God, who abandons himself in all things, and says, with an insatiable, impetuous, and burning love, Thy kingdom come. But that man is greater still, and follows still better the counsel of God, who overcomes his own self-will, and renounces it in love, and says unto God with reverent submission, Thy will be done in all things, and not my will. When Christ our dear Lord approached his passion, he said those very words unto his Father, in humble abnegation of himself. And they were to him the most happy, and to us the most wholesome, to the Father the most lovable, and to the devil the most terrible words which Christ ever spoke. For, by his renunciation of self-will according to his manhood, 
we are all saved. Yet this way the will of God now becomes to the loving and humble man the highest joy and the greatest desire of his ghostly feelings. Even though this will should lead him to hell, which is impossible, and here nature is cast down into the depths, and God is exalted most highly, and this man becomes capable of receiving all the gifts of God, for he has denied himself, and has renounced his own self, and has given all for all. And he therefore asks nothing, and wills nothing, but that which God wishes to give him. That which God wills, this is his joy. And he who surrenders himself to God in love is the most free of all men living. He lives without care, for God cannot lose that which is his. Now mark this. Although God knows all hearts, yet such a man is often tempted and tried of him. Whether he is able to renounce himself in freedom, and by this he may then become enlightened, and may live for the glory of God and also for his own salvation. And that is why God sometimes takes him from his right hand to his left, from heaven into hell, from all blessedness into great misery, so that it seems to him as though he were forsaken and despised of God and of all creatures. If, then, he has formally renounced himself and his own will in love and in joy, so that he sought not, not himself but the good pleasure of God, so he will easily renounce himself in pains and misery, so that in those he will seek not himself but always the glory of God. He who is willing to work great things is willing also to suffer great things, but to bear and to suffer in resignation is nobler and more pleasing to God, and more satisfying to our spirit, than to work great things in a like resignation, for it is more contrary to our nature. And this is why our spirit is more exalted and our nature more cast down by grievous suffering than by great works done with equal love. When a man maintains himself in this resignation, without any other preference, right as the one who neither wills nor knows anything else, then he possesses the spirit of counsel in two ways. For he satisfies the will and the counsel of God in his working and in his suffering, by self-surrender and by submissive obedience, and his nature is adorned most gloriously, and he is capable of being enlightened according to the Spirit. THE GIFT OF UNDERSTANDING And therefore God gives him the sixth gift, which is the Spirit of Understanding. This gift we have already likened to a fountain with three rills, for it establishes our spirit in the unity, it reveals truth, and it brings forth a wide and general love. This gift may also be likened to sunshine, for by its shining the sun fills the air with a simple brightness, and lights all forms, and shows the distinctions of all colors. Thereby it shows forth its own power, and its heat is common to the whole world, bringing forth fruits and useful things. So likewise does the first ray of this gift bring about simplicity within the spirit. And this simplicity is penetrated by a particular radiance even as the air of the heavens by the splendor of the sun. For the grace of God, which is the ground of all gifts, maintains itself essentially like to a simple light in our potential understanding, and by means of this simple light our spirit is made stable and onefold and enlightened, and fulfilled of grace and divine gifts, and here it is like unto God through the grace and divine love. And since the Spirit is now like unto God, 
and means and loves God alone above all things, it will no longer be satisfied by likeness, nor by any created brightness, for it has both nature and above nature a primal tendency towards the abysmal being from which it has flowed forth. And the unity of the divine being eternally draws back all likeness into its unity. And here the spirit is enkindled into fruition, and it melts into God as into its eternal rest. For the grace of God is to God even as the sunshine is to the sun, and the grace of God is the means and the way which leads us to God. And for this reason it shines within us in simplicity, and makes us deiform, that is, like unto God. And this likeness perpetually merges itself in God, and dies in God, and becomes one with God and remains one. For charity makes us one with God, and causes us to remain one, and to dwell in the one. Nevertheless, we keep the eternal likeness in the light of grace, or of glory, whereby we possess ourselves actively in charity and in the virtues, and we keep the union with God, above our activity, in the nakedness of our spirit, in the divine light, where we possess God in rest, above all virtues. For charity in the likeness must ever be at work, and union with God in fruitive love must ever be at rest. And this is the working of love. For in one now and at the same time love works and rests in its beloved. And the one is strengthened by the other. For the higher the love, the greater the rest, and the greater the rest, the deeper the love. For the one lives in the other, and whosoever loves not, rests not, and whosoever rests not, loves not. And yet, some good men think that they neither love nor rest in God, and this thought itself comes from love. Because they desire to love more than they can, it seems to them that their love falls short. And yet in this work they taste love and rest. For none save the resigned, emptied, and enlightened man can understand how one may love in labor and rest in fruition. Yet every lover is one with God in rest, and like unto God in the work of love. For God in his most high nature, of which we bear the likeness, dwells in fruition in eternal rest according to his essential unity but works in eternal activity according to the Trinity, and the one is the perfection of the other, for the rest abides in the unity and works in the Trinity, and thus they dwell together throughout eternity. And, therefore, if a man is to taste of God, he must love, and if he will love, then he may taste. But if he lets himself be satisfied with other things, he shall not be able to taste what God is. And therefore we must possess ourselves in simplicity, in virtue, in likeness and God, above ourselves through love and rest and unity. And this is the first way in which the man who is common to all is made stable. When the air is fulfilled, with the brightness of the sun, the beauty and the wealth of the whole world are revealed, and the eyes of men become enlightened and rejoice in the manifold diversity of colors. So it is, when we are onefold within ourselves, our power of understanding is enlightened and spirit of understanding shines through it then we can become aware of the high attributes which are in God, and which are the causes of all the works which flow forth from Him. Although all men may understand the works, and God through His works, yet no one can truly understand, neither in their appearance nor in their reality, 
the attributes of the works of God as they are in their ground, save by means of this Spirit. For this teaches us to seek out and to recognize our own nobleness, and it gives us the power to discern the virtues and all practices, and the way in which we should live without error in accordance with eternal truth. And he who is enlightened by it can dwell in the Spirit, and can, with enlightened reason, rightly apprehend and understand all things in heaven and on earth. And therefore such a tone, such a one, walks in heaven, and beholds and apprehends with all saints the nobility of his beloved, his incomprehensible height, his abysmal death, length and breadth, wisdom and truth, his bounty and his unspeakable generosity, and those love-worthy attributes which are in God our lover without number, and without limit in his most high nature. For all this is he himself. Then that enlightened man lowers his eyes and beholds himself and all other men and all creatures, and observes how God, in his free generosity, has created them in a nature and about endowed them in many ways, and how, above nature, it is his pleasure to endow them and to enrich them with himself, if they will but seek and desire him. All such reasoning, observation of the manifold diversities of the divine riches rejoices our spirit, if, through divine love, we have died unto ourselves in God, and if we live and walk in the Spirit, and taste of the things which are eternal. This gift of understanding shows us the unity which we possess in God. We have died unto ourselves in God, and if we live and walk in the Spirit, and taste of the things which are eternal. This gift of understanding shows us the unity we possess in God through the fruitive immersion of love, and also the likeness to God which we have in ourselves through the charity and works of virtue, and it gives us light and brightness, in which we can walk with discernment in the ways of the Spirit, and can seek out and recognize God in ghostly similitudes, and also ourselves and all things according to the mode and measure of that light, and according to the will of God, and the greater nobility of our understanding. This is the second degree in which man who is common to all may be enlightened. According to the measure which, is, which the air is irradiated by the brightness of the sun, so too the heat increases and brings all things to fruitfulness. When our reason and understanding are so enlightened that they can recognize and distinguish divine truth, then the will, that is, the power of love, grows hotter and streams forth in abundant loyalty and love towards all men in common. For this gift, through the knowledge of truth which is imparted to us in its light, establishes in us a wide-stretching love towards all in common. Now the most simple are also the most tranquil, and have the most peace in themselves, and are the most deeply immersed in God, and are most enlightened in understanding, and most fruitful in good works, and in outflowing love towards all in common. And they are hindered least for they are most like unto God. For God is simplicity in his being, clarity in his understanding, and outflowing in universal love in his works. And the more we are unlike unto God in these three things, so much the more closely we are united with him. And for this reason we must remain simple in our ground, and must apprehend all things by means of enlightened reason, and must flow forth through all things in universal love. 
So likewise the sun in the heavens, though it abides in itself simple and unchanged, sends forth its light and heat to the whole world in common. Now, understand how we should live with enlightened reason in universal love. The Father is the origin of the whole Godhead, according to essence and according to personality. We, therefore, should bow down in spirit, in humble awe, before the sublimity of the Father, and thereby we possess humility, the foundation of all the virtues. We should fervently adore, that is to say, we should honor and reverence the mightiness of the Father, because He, in His might, creates and preserves all things out of nothing, and thereby we shall be lifted up in ghostly wise. We should offer praise and thanks and everlasting service to the faithfulness and love of God, who has freed us from the fetters of the enemy and from eternal death, and thereby we shall be made free. We should present and bewail before the wisdom of God the blindness and ignorance of human nature, and should crave that all men may become enlightened, and may attain to the knowledge of truth. Thus God shall be known and honored by them. We should pray for the mercy of God upon sinners, that thus they may be converted, and may grow in virtue. Thus God shall be loved by them with a desirous love. We should give generously to all those who have need of it, of the rich treasure of God, that therewith they may all be filled, and may flow back towards God. And thus God shall be possessed by them all. We should offer it to the Father, with awe and reverence, all the service and all the works which Christ, according to his manhood, fulfilled in love. Thus all our prayers shall be heard. We shall also offer to the Father in Jesus Christ all the fervent devotion of the angels and the saints and the just, so we shall be united with them in all in the glory of God. We should also offer up to the Father the whole service of Holy Church, the holy sacrifice of all the priests, and all that we may achieve and think in the name of Christ, that thereby we may go out to meet God through Christ and may become like unto him in universal love, and may transcend all likeness in simplicity, and may be united with him within the essential unity. We should ever abide in oneness with God, and should eternally flow forth with God and all his saints in universal love, and continually return with thankfulness and praise, and immerse ourselves in fruit of love in the essential rest. This is the richest life of which I know, and in it we possess the gift of understanding. The Gift of Wisdom Now understand this well. When we turn within ourselves in contemplation, the fruit of unity of God is like to a darkness, and somewhat which is unconditioned and incomprehensible. And the spirit turns inward through love and through simplicity of intention, because it is active in all virtues, offering itself up in fruition above all virtues. In this loving introversion there arises the seventh gift, which is the spirit of savoring wisdom and it saturates the simplicity of our spirit, body, and soul with wisdom and with ghostly savors. And it is a ghostly touch or stirring within the unity of our spirit, and it is an inpouring and a source of all grace, all gifts, and all virtues. And in this touch of God, each man savors his exercise, and his life according to the power of the touch and the measure of his love. 
and this divine stirring is the inmost mediator between God and ourselves, between rest and activity, between the conditioned and the unconditioned, between eternity and time. And God works this ghostly touching within us, first of all, before all gifts. And yet it is known and tasted by us last of all. For only when we have lovingly sought God in all our practices, even to the inward depths of our ground, we must first feel the gushing in of all the graces and gifts of God. And we feel this touch in the unity of our highest powers, without reason, but not without reason, for we understand in truth that we are touched. But if we would know that this is, what this is and whence it comes, then reason and all creaturely observation fail. For though the air be illuminated by the sunlight and the eyes be sharp and sound, if one would follow the rays which bring up the brightness and look at the disk of the sun, the eyes would fail in their activity and would only receive the luster of the rays in a passive way. So, likewise, the reflection of the incomprehensible light in the unity of our highest power is so intense that all creaturely activity which works in distinction must fail. And here our activity must passively endure the interior working of God, which is the source of all divine gifts. For could we receive God himself into our comprehension, he would give himself to us without intermediary. But this is impossible to us because we are too narrow and too little to comprehend God. And therefore he pours his gifts into us according to the measure of our comprehension and the worthiness of our practices. For the fruitful unity of God ever abides above the unity of our powers and ever demands of us likeness in love and in virtue. And that is why we are touched again and again, that we may each time be renewed and become more like him in the virtues. And through these renewed touches, the spirit falls into hunger and thirst, and would taste through and through, and pass through and through the whole abyss in a storm of love, that thereby it may be satisfied. Hence there comes an eternal hungry craving, and an eternal unsatisfied desire. For all loving spirits desire and strive after God, each according to its nobleness and the measure which it has been touched by God. Yet God remains eternally incomprehensible by way of our active desires, and therefore there abides in us, together with all saints, an eternal hunger, an eternal desirous introversion. And in the meeting with God, the radiance and the heat are so great and so limitless that all spirits must fail in their activity, and must melt and vanish away in sensible love in the unity of their spirit. And here they must passively endure as sheer creatures the working of God, and here our spirit and divine grace and all our virtue are one sensible love without activity. For our spirit has spent itself and has itself become love, and here the spirit is simple and susceptible of all gifts and is capable of every virtue, and in this ground of sensible love there dwells the gushing spring that is, the inpouring or inward working of God, which at every hour moves us and urges us and draws us inward and causes us to flow forth into new works of virtue. Thus I have shown to you the ground and the conditions of all virtues.